Research Institutes, the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics, Order, the Doherty Senator Institute. Pratt, time for in to be interrupted. Questions? Time. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. ABS labour force figures released today show that 2.7 million Australian workers either lost their job or had less work in April. One out of every five Australian workers. These are truly devastating figures and indicate just how difficult the past few weeks have been for millions of Australians and their families. Minister, 600,000 people have lost their job in the past month, the largest fall ever recorded. In light of these confronting numbers, is the government prepared to reconsider the eligibility criteria for JobKeeper so that more people can remain in employment? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Let me first, uh, of course, recognise these are devastating uh, figures. Um, they're not entirely unanticipated, but they are uh, devastating. Uh, and uh, the, that is, of course, why the government has put uh, very um, significant uh, support measures in place uh, to keep as many Australians connected uh, to their employer uh, as possible during this period. And about six million uh, Australians are now benefiting from the support provided through JobKeeper. And indeed, 1.6 million uh, Australians are receiving uh, the enhanced uh, support through the enhanced job seeker uh, arrangements. Uh, uh, Mr uh, uh, President, as a result of the measures that we have taken, while these numbers are devastating, of course they are, uh, the Australian position and the position for uh, working families around Australia is much better than it is um, in many other parts of the world where the health effect has been more devastating and where the economic impact of the coronavirus has been more devastating. I know that that is called comfort to those who are facing uh, difficulties uh, through this period. We, we absolutely understand that. But we are doing the best we can, and I mean, the JobKeeper program uh, has been designed in a very, very generous way in order to support uh, six million Australians who are now taking advantage of the opportunities through that program. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you. So I take it you won't reconsider. Today's figures show that underemployment rose to a record rate of 13.7 per cent, with over 1.8 million Australians being underemployed and almost oh, 500,000 left the labour force altogether. What would the un unemployment rate be if nearly half a million Australians hadn't simply given up looking for work entirely? Senator Cormann. Um, th th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I, I think that in the circumstances it is not uh, surprising that uh, workforce participation, the workforce participation rate has decreased. I mean, it was at a record high or close to a record high at 66 per cent in March, and it has reduced to 63.5 per cent, which is still, which is still rather high in the circumstances. Now, um, as Treasury has indicated, the expectation is uh, for uh, unemployment to uh, continue to rise uh, through to the June quarter to about 10 per cent. If we had not provided the supports that we have provided through the JobKeeper package, you know, in particular, and other measures, uh, unemployment was expected to rise to 15 per cent, which is where it is at in many other jurisdictions. And in many other jurisdictions, it is 15 per cent and higher, uh, up to more than 20 per cent uh, in, in, in some cases. So uh, yes, I mean, nobody will be surprised that this is a difficult period. We all know that. We're dealing with a major global health pandemic, uh, and we're doing the best we can to help the Australian community through it. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Isn't it the case that if the government had acted sooner and provided JobKeeper for more Australians, such as the 1.1 million casuals who have been with their employers for less than 12 months, these figures wouldn't be as devastating as they are today? Could the government have acted to protect more jobs? Senator Cormann. Th thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I, 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 think, I think that that is an unreasonable uh, proposition. It's an unreasonable proposition. I mean, we, we, are, we are dealing with an unbelievably hard-hitting global uh, health pandemic uh, with devastating impacts all, all around the world. Uh, in Australia, by any measure, by any objective measure, and look, I wouldn't expect the opposition to be objective, but, but you know, we can understand why the uh, opposition uh, is throwing rocks at those that are making the decisions. I, I understand that that is sort of the, the way that you go about these things, but the truth is, 
in dealing with this, we have been, we're winning the fight against the virus. We're putting ourselves in a position where we can start easing restrictions and start getting the economy growing again so that businesses around Australia can start hiring people uh, again and so that Australians can again be in a position to build uh, sustainable uh, livelihoods and lift their living standards. And, 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 here, and here you are continuing to uh, nitpick in a partisan fashion. It's rather disappointing. Order. Order. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr. Order President. On my left. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on the Australian Labor Force figures for the month of April? Further, what steps is the Liberal National Coalition Government taking to contain the economic impact of the coronavirus pandemic on employment? Order. The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Abetz for the question. And, uh, Mr President, as the Prime Minister said in his uh, address to the nation today, this is a very tough day for so many Australians and uh, some very difficult news for all of us. Uh, as the Minister for Finance has said, though, COVID-19 is a health and economic shock, uh, the likes of which not just Australia but the world has never seen. And the government knew that the impact of COVID-19 on the economy would result in job losses. Today's jobs figures saw the number of jobs decrease by 594,300 in the month of April. We went from record employment in Australia of 13 million Australians in March to 12.4 million due to the impact of COVID-19. As a result, what we've seen today is the unemployment rate rise to 6.2 per cent. We also saw the participation rate, which was at near records high again in March, of 66 per cent, fall to 63.5 per cent. Again, as the Prime Minister said, those Australians who have lost their jobs, they're our fellow Australians, they're our family members, they're our friends and they're our neighbours. Mr President, though, given that significant parts of the Australian economy are still in lockdown, they're subject to those COVID-19 restrictions, today's figures are not surprising, but they clearly do show the difficult situation being faced by so many Australians. Today's unemployment figures would have been far higher, though, if the government hadn't introduced Senator Abetz its $130 billion JobKeeper program which the Prime Minister also announced today now covers six million workers. Senator Abetz, a supplementary question. Uh, thanks, Mr President. What action has the government taken to help secure the employment opportunities of our fellow Australians? Senator what? Sorry, Senator Cash. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. Yeah, sorry. What? I was look what? See, my error, I was looking down the question time sheet. Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr President. My apologies. And as the parliament would be aware, the government has put in place $320 billion in economic support measures to get through and past the COVID-19 crisis. And this, of course, includes the JobKeeper payment, um, which now covers around 6 million Australians. The expansion of the job seeker payment, access to superannuation and, of course, direct financial support to families. Mr President, when we look at Australia's investment in terms of a percentage of GDP, our investment, our investment is at the top of the leaderboard globally, showing that we are as prepared as we can be in terms of other countries. Again, as I said, as the Prime Minister has confirmed today, the $130 billion JobKeeper payment now supports over 6 million employees staying connected to their employer. Senator Abetz, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you for that answer, Minister. Turning to the long term, what plans will the government implement to restore our economic fortunes, support small business, the engine room of jobs growth and, most importantly, get Australians back into employment. Senator Cash. Well, thank you very much, Mr President. And 
The ability for the government to respond in the way that it has with the $320 billion uh, support measures really has reminded Australians of the importance of a strong and stable financial position. The path to recovery is by growing the economy. As the Prime Minister and the Minister for Finance himself has said, through productivity enhancing reforms and, of course, supporting small and family businesses. Um, the focus of our recovery, Senator Abetz, will be on practical solutions, including reskilling and upskilling the workforce, maintaining uh, our $100 billion 10 year infrastructure pipeline, uh, infrastructure jobs. Um, you know, infrastructure does create jobs. But of course, that important cutting red tape um, to reduce the cost burden on businesses and on the economy. There is a long road ahead. Uh, there will be no doubt there will be further challenges, order. but we are Senator prepared Cash, to order. face them. My apologies again. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. This week, the Prime Minister described his government's bushfire recovery work as sensational and tremendous. Troy Pauling of Yowri, who is still living with his family in a caravan and shed, near the uncleared ruins of their burnt-down home says, and I quote, the kids cry. They don't want to be here. If we got this cleared, we'd have the ball rolling, but it's just way too slow. What does the Prime Minister have to say to Mr Pauling? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, uh, you know, clearly the bushfire crisis was devastating for the uh, impacted uh, communities and continues to be devastating. Uh, there's no question. But uh, the Australian government, working with relevant state governments, is doing everything we can to provide appropriate levels of support. And I mean, over $271 million were paid directly to families and individuals in direct support. Over $237 million paid to more than 195,000 eligible individuals in disaster recovery payment and disaster recovery uh, allowance as of uh, 3rd in May. Over $33 million in payments made for over 3,000 impacted children. Uh, and there are, there are many other things that were done, but like nothing, nothing that I can say. And I mean, you know, Senator Watt is not asking this question out of genuine and sincere concern. He's asking this question to my- Order. Senator, I've got Senator Wong. That is a clear imputation. I'd ask that it be withdrawn. For, I'll, for, the, for the operation of question time, I'll, I'll ask uh, for the operation of question time. I'll ask Senator Cormann to withdraw. I withdraw. Thank withdraw. you, Sen now, Thank you but, Senator. But let, let, me, let me just make this point: uh, none, no, no, no amount of politicking in this chamber will help. The, no amount of politicking in this chamber will help uh, those uh, families that are continuing to be severely impacted by the uh, effects of the bushfires. No amount of politicking will help them. We are doing everything we can. We are working as hard as we can, bearing in mind that many of the lead responsibilities for uh, these matters are at the state <laughs> level. But we are doing everything we can, and we are providing financial support as fast as we can. Uh, and you know, of course, we have set up the uh, Bushfire uh, Recovery Agency. We are uh, work. We have put in place the Bushfire Recovery Fund, and we are providing uh, support, uh, supports, working together with the uh, relevant state governments uh, as fast and as effectively as possible. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. This week, the Prime Minister said the government's bushfire recovery work is being done methodically and steadily, and Australians are seeing that in action. What does the Prime Minister say to Mr Jim Neal of Cabago, who is still living in a donated caravan that leaks sewerage on the dirt patch that used to be his home? Senator Cormann. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, I say the same as what I said in response to the primary answer. You know, of, of course, there are still continuing uh, devastating impacts from the bushfire crisis. I mean, that is uh, practically unavoidable. Uh, but, but we are working our way through these things in a way that is uh, methodical, and, and, and we are going through it as fast as we can. Uh, and we have provided significant levels of support, and, and more support will be uh, provided over the coming weeks and months. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Figures released by the government just this week showed that five months on from the height of the bushfires, less than $260 million of the Prime Minister's $2 billion bushfire recovery fund has actually been spent. To quote a hand-painted painted sign in Bega, $2 billion bushfire fund, where is it? 
Why is the Prime Minister more concerned with marketing and spin than with actually helping bushfire victims? Order. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, Senator Watt is not going to help those uh, communities through, with, through his political spin. Uh, through his political spin, because we put in place a $2 billion fund which came on top of all of the uh, disaster recovery support that was provided into the community. We put in, a two billion, we put in place a $2 billion fund over two calendar years for, two, for the bushfire recovery. I mean, there was the immediate disaster uh, response, and, and I've gone through a number. And, you know, when I went through the numbers of expenditures on that, uh, all I was uh, told was, why are you just giving us numbers? Uh, well, I say it again, $271 million paid to families and individuals. Over 237 million paid to more than 193,000 eligible individuals in disaster recovery payment and disaster recovery allowance. And by the end of June, we will have spent about one billion dollars out of the two billion dollar fund in the first six months. In the first six months of a two-year program, we will have spent about half. Order, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My questions to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Minister, are you confident that the COVID Commission is free of conflicts of interest when it comes to proposals on energy investments? Isn't it true that donations from the fossil fuel industry to the major parties have more than doubled in the last four years, that the Commission is jam-packed full of fossil fuel boosters, that there are no binding rules to address conflicts of interest, and that advice from the Commission to government will be kept secret? Where is the transparency? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. I say, uh, what I say what I said yesterday, I say again today. Uh, the uh, COVID Coordination Commission is made up of uh, a number of distinguished Australians uh, and a number of distinguished Australians who know how to manage conflicts, and I have every confidence that they will uh, continue to manage conflicts as appropriate. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. Given your government's spruiking of toxic methane gas and your COVID Commission's obvious bias, are we at risk of a gas rush that will fuel the climate crisis and put Australians at risk? Why are you willing to listen to the health experts on the COVID crisis, but not to the climate experts on the climate emergency? Senator Cormann. Um, uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I I'm sort of trying to find a way to translate that question. At least there was a question mark at the end, I think. But, um, if, if you're asking me whether I hope that we will boost the exploration and production of gas so that our uh, businesses around Australia, in particular manufacturing businesses around Australia, can have reliable access to uh, more affordable and more competitively priced supplies of gas, then the answer is a resounding yes, of course. Uh, I, hope, I hope that will be the case. And if the uh, COVID Coordination Commission can help to bring that about, that would be good for the economy. It would be good for working families around Australia because it will help us to be uh, more successful in competing with uh, uh, exporting uh, businesses from other parts of the world. But, but I, hope, I, hope that that is the way, uh, I hope that that is what you are asking and that I've answered uh, the right question. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Uh, thanks, President. Last night, the government was forced into an embarrassing clarification that the chair of the COVID committee is being paid not half a million dollars for six months, but a quarter of a million dollars. Is the government embarrassed that it is paying these obscenely high amounts to an unelected body stacked with fossil fuel mates, while it excludes half a million young people from JobKeeper, and it is intending to drop, drop JobSeeker back below the poverty line in September? Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Firstly, let me correct uh, Senator Waters. Uh, mm -hmm. The chair of the COVID Commission is not uh, getting a salary not getting a salary. Following the announcement of the NC, following the announcement of the National COVID Coordination Commission, the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet <laughs> undertook work to establish an arrangement to cover the assessed likely expenses of the chair and a suitable per diem for the commissioners. Uh, neither the Prime Minister nor his office was involved in the establishment of these arrangements and, and of course, uh, as you have indicated, the department has provided uh, a further statement following uh, the um, Senate committee hearing that you reference. Um, you know, Mr. Powers, flights, accommodation, other incidental travel costs are being covered in his role as NCC chair. However, he's not receiving a salary. And in developing and executing Mr. Powers' contract, the uh, uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet has estimated travel to and from Canberra. And, you know, he does come from Perth. And, you know, we are a, a, a big continent. And uh, people from Western Australia Order, should also Senator be Coleman, allowed to participate in these sorts of processes. Expired. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate uh, rep representing the Prime Minister. 
Is it not the case that during the course of January the Prime Minister received at least five purportedly secret briefings from his department on the coronavirus outbreak? Is it not the case that the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet has refused to release any of those five briefings? Is it not the case that un uh, access under FOI has been totally refused? Not one word has been released. Given the government's de uh, declaration to be completely transparent with the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19, and with the Australian public, will the Leader of the Government in the Senate consult with the Prime Minister and seek the prompt release of the briefings to better inform the investigation of the Select Committee? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr President. It won't surprise Senator Patrick to hear me say that uh, in relation to the specific uh, items he's raised, uh, I will have to take that part on notice, uh, as I uh, am not personally aware of all of the uh, you know, details that he uh, has uh, read out. Um, in terms of the general point, I would uh, put it to Senator Patrick that this government is being uh, uh, entirely open and transparent uh, to the uh, COVID uh, committee, the Senate Select Committee to the COVID response by the government, in, in a way that is consistent with the usual rules, conventions and processes and standards applied by previous governments. And certain matters, certain matters are uh, uh, exempt from disclosure, for example, you know, things relating to the deliberative processes of uh, cabinet, uh, and, but subject, subject to those uh, qualifications, uh, of course, um, I, I'll take on notice uh, what uh, Senator Patrick has asked about, and uh, I'll return to the chamber when I can. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has delayed FOI decisions on the release of DFAT cables sent from our embassy in Beijing in January reporting on the COVID-19 outbreak in China. It's also the case that the Health Department has moved to obstruct FOI releases of the initial coronavirus modelling and assessments received by the government on 13 February and 3 March. Given the public interest in fully understanding these events, um, where, will you take on uh, Representing to the relevant Order, ministers, Senator the Patrick, release of that information. The question has expired. Senator Corbyn. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Again, I don't think it will surprise Senator Patrick to hear me say that, in terms of the specifics, uh, I, um, I uh, will take that on notice. I'm not aware of uh, the specific uh, FOI requests he raises. Uh, the Senator Patrick would also be aware that there are uh, laws that uh, uh, guide uh, and uh, that, that uh, provide for how this. Um, matters are to be handled and there are appropriate review processes in place, of course, that I, I know uh, for a fact that he extensively takes advantage of these uh, processes and opportunities that are available to him, uh, but uh, I, I will take the uh, specifics of that question on notice. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. The government has rightly called on China to be more transparent about the origins of the COVID-19 outbreak. The government also wants uh, the World Health Organization's performance to be scrutinised. Wouldn't these calls to, on China and the World Health Organization be much stronger and, and much less exposed to the charge of hypocrisy if the government itself implemented full transparency about its own response to the pandemic? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, again, I mean, our government uh, is uh, uh, and highly open and transparent, uh, you know, as appropriate, uh, bearing in mind uh, national uh, interest and relevant national interest and legal considerations, uh, in the same way as uh, governments of both uh, political persuasions have done in the past. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Can the minister advise of the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on women? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I particularly thank Senator Stoker for her question. Mr. President, the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting the lives of women and men differently, uh, and today's job figures do reinforce this. Of the jobs lost in the months to the 20th of April, 55% of those had been held by women. And that reflects the fact that uh, many uh, less secure jobs are held by women, and women are overrepresented in occupations strongly affected by some of our very necessary physical distancing measures. I note that women's workforce participation has also fallen by 2.9 percentage points uh, to 58.4 per cent. Mr. President, the demand for unpaid care work which we know disproportionately affects women's ability to undertake paid employment, has risen, with children needing homeschooling uh, and with the increased care needs of elderly Australians uh, as well. 
However, as a government, we are very aware that women will be vital to the economic recovery. Australia needs everyone's full capabilities, both men and women, to ensure that recovery. That's why, the government has, uh, that's why the government's introduction of the JobKeeper payment to help keep Australians employed is so important, as the Minister for Finance has reinforced uh, today, and particularly in ensuring women in seriously affected industries are supported uh, through the pandemic. It's also why we ensured that uh, free early childhood education and care for about a million families, no matter what type of service uh, they use, was available uh, in the pandemic. As the Treasurer said earlier this week, Mr. President, I would remind the Chamber, we know a strong economy is the foundation for everything else, and women will be particularly critical to ensuring that our economy remains strong as we emerge from this pandemic. Senator Stoker, a supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate of the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the risk of family and domestic violence and advise of what the government is doing to address that risk? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. Senator Stoker asks a very serious question because we know that major crisis events have historically led to an increased incidence of violence against women. Uh, as senators would be aware, the government has announced, uh, Mr Rustin and I, a $150 million uh, support for the COVID-19 domestic violence support package, funding that will help states and territories to meet immediate needs for crisis accommodation, frontline services and perpetrator intervention programs. And we've seen a number of those uh, rolled out and announced by the states and territories in that context, uh, Mr President. To ensure that Australians know where to turn for support, uh, we have also launched the Help Is Here campaign, which provides that clear information on how Australians are able to access services at any time of the day or night. Uh, there are indicators of a greater need for services, most certainly. 1800 Respect has seen an increase in, in calls, particularly after midnight. The No to Violence Men's Referral Service experienced a very significant increase in demand Order, after Payne. those community restrictions time were announced. Time for the answers expired. Senator Stoker, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate of what Australia is doing internationally to help women and girls through the coronavirus pandemic? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. It is fair to say that the particular impacts of COVID-19 on women are, of course, not confined to Australia. Uh, I've had a number of valuable discussions with women foreign and women's ministers uh, around the world, across many countries, about how uh, the importance, about the importance of ensuring that gender inequalities aren't exacerbated or entrenched by COVID-19, and these conversations are ongoing. Australia has also uh, joined a number of strong international statements and resolutions that help to increase the focus uh, in international bodies and conversations on promoting gender responsiveness to the pandemic. In our region, the Australian Pacific Women's Partnership is supporting crisis centres that are providing remote counselling and frontline services for vulnerable women. And through our NABALAN program, we're working to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in women's shelters in Timor-Leste in particular. With international partners such as UN Women, we're adapting and boosting our efforts to address the impact of the pandemic on women in the Indo-Pacific region. Order, Senator Payne. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. The only advice Minister Cormann could offer Darcy Mor Moran, a hospitality worker suffering as a result of the Morrison government's refusal to include him and workers like him in JobKeeper, was, and I quote, what we think would be fair to Darcy is if the state government in Victoria started easing restrictions. Was Minister Cormann's advice, which is contrary to the decision of the National Cabinet last Friday that states set out their own timetables, informed by health advice provided by the Minister for Health or his office? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr President, and I uh, thank Senator Kitching for the question, but Senator Kitching, I actually disagree with the premise of what you're putting. Uh, Senator Cormann was, of course, right to say that people who are currently unemployed uh, will have more success in obtaining a job as each individual state and territory eases its COVID restrictions. That is the point that Senator Cormann was actually making. And can I just say, if you actually look at, and this is just it, as Senator Cormann has so rightly said, um, we have a Labor Premier in my, and Mark McGowan in Western Australia. We're moving, Senator Cormann, if I understand, to stage two 
to stage two to 20 people as of Monday. That has been widely welcomed in Western Order. Australia, but in particular by the hospitality industry, Order. who know they are a step ahead of those states and territories that have not yet moved to 20 people. You look at what's happening in the Northern Territory and how that has been welcomed uh, by people in the Northern Territory. So Senator Cormann was right. Someone in that case, a person who does not have a job, has more of a chance of getting a job the quicker that individual states open up their economies. That is what Senator Order. Cormann was saying. Order. Order. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Was Minister Cormann relying on advice provided by the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee or other relevant public health agencies? Or does the minister support Minister Cormann undermining the decisions of the National Cabinet and the protections put in place by the Victorian government on advice from its, health, its public health authorities? Senator Cash. Well, again, I have to completely reject the premise of the question, um, because that is not the advice that was given. If a person does not have a job at this particular point in time, and that is a very, very sobering state for any person, they will, it will be easier for them to get a job as we see the COVID-19 restrictions in individual states and territories eased. Senator Cormann also said, though, and this is absolutely based on the health advice, those restrictions need to be eased and businesses need to open in a COVID-safe way. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Order. Order. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. Does Minister Cormann's outburst against the Victorian government reflect the Morrison government's position, or will he also be forced to issue a statement to withdraw, like Minister Tian did only hours after his outburst on insiders? Senator Cash. Uh, well, can I say, Mr President, based on outbursts that I have seen from people in this chamber, there was no outburst by Senator Cormann yesterday. Order. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister outline what the Morrison Coalition government is doing to support young Australians as they face the mental health challenges of the coronavirus pandemic? The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And I thank Senator Smith for his question. Mr. President, we know that a significant number of young Australians are experiencing the mental health impacts of coronavirus, and last week mental health organisation Reach Out revealed the, uh, the, uh, that the um, unprecedented numbers of young people have sought mental health support during the COVID-19 pandemic so far, with services increasing by 50 per cent since this time last year. Mr President, our government is determined to ensure that mental health support is available and accessible for every young Australian in Australia, and we know that mental health doesn't discriminate. The message I want all Australians to hear, particularly young Australians, is that support and help is available. That's why on the 29th of March the Prime Minister announced a $1.1 billion package that included a boost to mental health services including uh, during COVID-19, $10 million towards a dedicated coronavirus wellbeing support line delivered by Beyond Blue, which commenced on the 6th of April, $6.8 million to help young Australians with their education and training and prepare them for the workforce by expanding the Headspace Digital Work and Study Service to provide employment study support. Uh, funding to enhance the Find a Psychologist website to help all Australians, fund, uh, including our youth, to better locate psychologists and telehealth services available to them. Mr President, in addition, yesterday Minister Hunt announced a new Deputy Health Commissioner, solely dedicated to mental health. This exemplifies our government's strong support and commitment to tackle mental, the issue of mental health in this country. Earlier in the year, we also announced $76 million in mental health uh, to support packages to support Australians affected by the bushfires, and we continue to support young Australians as they go through these challenges. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, 
Mr President, I'm sure everyone in the Senate chamber will acknowledge the great work that Reach Out does do, as do other mental health service providers. Uh, Minister, what support is the government providing directly to young Australians during these challenging times? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, and as we've heard uh, during this question time today and earlier, as the unemployment figures have been released, the very sobering job figures that we um, are experiencing as we go move through the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and in the youth sense, it's up from 11.6 per cent to 13.8. That's why the government has moved to temporarily, exp uh, temporarily expand the eligib eligibility to income support payments and as as establish a new time-limited coronavirus supplement. This will be paid to both existing and new recipients of income support programs, including JobSeeker, Payment, Youth Allowance, Job Seeker, amongst others. Many of these payments will be primarily directed towards young Australians. JobKeeper, the JobKeeper payments currently supporting almost 5.5 million employees to stay connected to their employer. And as of last week, we are supporting almost 13,000 employers to retain 22,000 young apprentices through a wage subsidy. Senator Smith, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, what more can young Australians be doing to assist in flattening of the curve and combating this pandemic? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And thanks, Senator Smith. And can I firstly thank all young Australians for their efforts so far in working with health authorities, with state governments and the, the Australian government in their efforts to date to flatten the curve. Our actions have slowed the spread of co co coronavirus and made a huge impact on our capacity to start bringing the economy back. But can I encourage all young Australians to download the COVID Safe app? It's, it's our capacity to track, our capacity to trace and our capacity to test that will all help to uh, assist state governments and the Australian government to open the economy back up, provide opportunities for jobs and assist all young Australians to return to the things that they love, whether that be sport, whether it be arts, whether it be music. Mr. President, so can I just urge all young Australians uh, to join the rest of us that have downloaded the COVID safe Safe app Order. to assist Senator with Colbeck. our jobs. Senator Ayres. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. I refer to reports in the Australian Financial Review that the superannuation accounts of close to 100,000 Australians have been emptied of their retirement savings as a result of the Morrison government's early access scheme. Emptied. The Australian Financial Review reports that these accounts are most likely those of younger Australians. Can the minister explain what the long-term impact of reduced retirement savings and foregone earnings as a result of the government program will be for the retirement income of those Australians? The minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. Well, I mean, the first answer that I would provide is that these Australians are accessing their own money under a range that we put in place. Uh, the average withdrawal uh, is about $8,000, uh, and, and it is individual Australians, including young Australians, exercising their judgment, their own personal judgment, on how to deal in their circumstances with the implications on them of this one in a hundred year event. One in a hundred year event. And, and Senator, Senator, order, the Senator, order. Senator Cormann, Senator Ayres on a point of order. A po point of order, Mr. President. On relevance, the question was very straightforward. What is the impact on those 100,000 Australians' retirement incomes? Uh, that was the conclusion of your question. The minister can be directly relevant while directly addressing the subject matter of any part of the question, including the preamble. I, I, I'm listening carefully, but I think, with respect, the minister is being directly relevant in direct being to the question and the preamble. Senator Cormann. Uh, Senator, uh, Mr. President, I can't remember an occasion where I would have been more directly relevant to a question than this occasion, uh, Mr. President. So uh, that was a rather, that was a rather, that was a rather, I, I'm always directly relevant, of course, but I can't remember an occasion when I was more directly relevant than on this occasion. So that was a rather spurious point of order. But like, so just to come to the second part of the question, 
Um, and as uh, the uh, good senator, uh, of course, uh, did acknowledge, I mean, these are younger Australians, younger Australians, and younger Australians will be in the workforce longer, uh, and they will have the opportunity to catch up in terms of their retirement savings, which is a very important point. But right now, they are able to use their own money through a system that we put in place to deal with uh, an unprecedented challenge in their personal circumstances, and Australians overwhelmingly have embraced this opportunity. Senator Ayers, a supplementary question. Can the minister confirm that, months after the declaration of the COVID-19 pandemic, the largest single financial support to Australians in need has been the $11 billion that struggling Australians have been forced to raid from their personal retirement savings? Senator Cormann. Uh, uh, no, um, no um, Mr. President, I cannot confirm that. I mean, $130 billion, $130 billion in JobKeeper, for starters. $130 billion in JobKeeper. And, and of course, and of course uh, Senator Watt seems to suggest that we should put it all out in one go. That is what Senator Watt seems to suggest. Let's just put $130 billion out in one go. Bang. Uh, but of course, I mean, uh, a, lot of, a lot of support has gone out. A lot of support has gone out. We've put the details of that on the public record. I'm prepared on notice to provide a, 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 an updated, detailed account of all of the support that has gone into the community. Senator Ayers, a final supplementary question. Order. Why has the government forced up to 100,000 Australians to raid their retirement savings instead of providing Australians with timely, and adequate support during this crisis. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. We have not forced any Australian to do anything. We have empowered, we have empowered individual Australians to make their own decisions. To make their own decisions. Like, uh, it is up to them. They are using their own money. They're exercising their own free judgment. And it is, it is, a, it is an important measure to left. complement the very significant support that we have put in place through a doubling, effective doubling of job seeker support and, of course, a $130 billion JobKeeper program providing support to 6 million Australians. Quite frankly, that question is completely out of touch. Senator Scar. Order. Order. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister outline how Defence is using its defence cooperation programs to support international partners to respond to the coronavirus pandemic? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, Senator Scar, for that question. Uh, I am very proud that this government is committed to supporting all our friends and security partners with their responses to COVID-19. Our ADF and also our defence personnel have been working side by side with their Pacific uh, counterparts as we address this global pandemic together. I've pivoted and stepped up our defence cooperation programs across the region to meet the changing security needs of our partners. I remain in very close contact with my international counterparts to coordinate our own responses to COVID-19 and also to deal with the geostrategic challenges that this pandemic is only serving to intensify. Defence has rolled out very successful online training packages to prepare our own ADF personnel to conduct medical support tasks. We've already pivoted and provided this training package to 19 friends and neighbours and it's been translated already into Bahasa and to into Vietnamese, with some more to follow. In the Pacific, I've redirected $18 million worth of defence funding to help address immediate health, economic and security impacts of COVID-19 in the region. We're leveraging an existing contract for aerial surveillance under the Pacific Security Maritime Program to support the movement of supplies through the Pacific and also to Timor-Leste in the humanitarian corridor, so ably led by our foreign minister. In Papua New Guinea, we have 40 ADF members working alongside their PNG counterparts, providing technical advice, specialist equipment and also training. Our defence advisers, also across the region, are supporting a range of tasks, including strategic maritime and airlift, to support the PNG Defence Force operations and the refurbishment of critical infrastructure and capabilities. We all, again, should be very proud of our ADF and their support to our region. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Minister. Can the Minister inform the Senate what support Defence has provided to Pacific Island countries, specifically in response to tropical cyclone Harold? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you. Uh, Tropical Cyclone Harold was indeed devastating to a number of nations in our immediate region. 
and Australia's defence forces, like they so often do, are playing an important role to assist our Pacific family respond to Tropical Cyclone Harold. Just as their own troops stood side by side with our ADF during our own Black Summer. It's this mateship and also our solidarity, both in the good times and the bad times, that makes our region so strong. The Morrison government remains resolutely support committed to strengthening Australia's long standing relationships in the Pacific through the ADF assistance in support of our friends and our neighbours. To date, the Royal Australian Air Force has conducted three emergency flight relief support flights to Vanuatu and another four to Fiji. These flights have delivered tonnes of life-saving supplies and assistance, including shelter kits and tents, Order. utensils, Senator Reynolds, blankets, lamps and water has containers. Expired. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Can the minister outline why our defence partnerships in the South Pacific are of such high importance to Australia? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr President. There has never been a more important time for Australia to stand side by side with our near neighbours. Together we are tackling the scourge of the COVID-19 pandemic. As we continue to address COVID-19 at home, uh, we are standing by our region in assisting them manage shared health, secu health security and the economic impacts of COVID-19. Being there for each other in challenging and uncertain times goes to the heart of our Pacific step up. Australia's COVID-19 response builds on the Morrison government's Pacific step up, which continues to grow regional economies, which continues to build resilience and continues to enhance regional stability through our defence, policing and our border security cooperation. The Pacific is our home. And Australia's engagement in the Pacific remains one of our highest priorities in these challenging times. Senator Wall. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. When did the Chief Medical Officer first brief the Cabinet in relation to COVID 19? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Um, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I thank Senator Wong for that uh, question. I believe it's a matter of uh, public record that the uh, National Incident Room was activated on 20 January and the first briefing would have happened sometime before that. I don't, I'm, can't recall or can't recollect a specific date. I'm happy to take that part of the uh, question uh, on uh, notice, but uh, I think that we've been uh, entirely uh, open and transparent along the way and the Prime Minister has taken the Australian people into his confidence uh, every step of the way and it was a rapidly evolving situation. Uh, we were one of the first uh, countries in the world uh, to put in place border uh, restrictions uh, effective from 1 February uh, in terms of any non-Australian return travel from mainland China. We were one of the first, uh, I believe, uh, to declare uh, this as a, uh, as a, as a pandemic. Uh, but uh, you know, in terms of the specific question that was asked, as I've indicated, it would have been some time before the uh, activation of the National Incident Room, which has been publicly announced as having happened on 20 January. Senator Wong, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, when Labor moved to establish the COVID-19 Select Committee, the minister told the Senate, and I quote, "We welcome the scrutiny. We do believe there is a need for scrutiny, and we understand and appreciate that." The Prime Minister's own department has now, on two occasions, refused to answer the question: When the, did the Chief Medical <laughs> Officer first brief the Cabinet in relation to COVID-19? Given that question includes neither content about deliberations nor anything else, Cabinet in confidence, can the minister please provide the answer as to the date? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, let, let me just say up front that I absolutely stand by the statement uh, that I made. I wasn't, uh, you know, obviously at the uh, hearing that Senator Wong uh, references. I've already, uh, under, I've already taken uh, that part of the question uh, on notice, and I'll get back to the chamber when I can. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. This is a once-in-a-century pandemic. It has unprecedented health and economic impacts on the nation. Australians deserve to know how the government responded to the threat of this pandemic. Can the minister explain why the Prime Minister's own department has refused to answer this simple and factual question? What are they seeking to hide? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I reject uh, the uh, premise of the question. We're not seeking uh, to hide anything. I've already, I mean, clearly, I think Senator Wong completely ignores the answers that I've given to the first uh, two questions, including uh, that I undertook to attack that part of the question on notice. Senator MacDonald. 
My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reductions, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is investing in hydrogen as part of Australia's energy future? The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reductions, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Macdonald for her question. And, uh, I know that she prides uh, um, Australia's reputation uh, as a long-standing, reliable supplier of energy, uh, not just for our country but to the world, uh, and, like all on this side, is committed to ensure that Australia continues to be that successful supplier of energy to the world. It's why the Morrison government is committed to delivering affordable and reliable electricity to the Australian people uh, and, indeed, to the rest of the world. And hydrogen, we recognise, has the potential to be an important part of our future energy mix and a large new potential export industry for Australia. We have worked uh, under the leadership of the Chief Scientist and in cooperation with all states and territories on the landmark National Hydrogen Strategy. The strategy will see governments and industry realise Australia's potential, building on our ability and our comparative advantage in the potential production <laughs> of hydrogen. Our government has backed hydrogen production to the tune of over half a billion dollars. This includes over $150 million committed to research, pilots, trials and demonstrations, $70 million in funding for electrolysis-related projects, and now adding some $300 million for the new Advancing Hydrogen Fund. This new fund will finance projects focused on growing a clean, innovative and competitive hydrogen industry in Australia. It is the government's first financing fund dedicated specifically to hydrogen projects. The fund will back projects that align with priorities under the National Hydrogen Strategy in areas such as advancing hydrogen production, developing export and domestic supply chains, establishing hydrogen hubs and backing projects that build domestic demand for hydrogen. The government has also set critically an economic goal for hydrogen to be produced at or less than $2 per kilogram. At this price, hydrogen starts to compete with alternatives in large-scale energy deployment across our energy system and becomes a commercial opportunity in its own right, which is absolutely a catalyst Senator point Birmingham. the Australian government Senator is Senator MacDonald, a supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate of the export opportunities this offers Australia? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, our country prides ourselves on being a long-term, reliable and affordable supplier of energy, not just within Australia but critically across the region and the world. And the hydrogen industry, like those that have come before it, such as LNG at this point in time, has the ability to make a tremendous positive impact both here at home and in its contribution overseas. From cheaper energy bills and job creation in regional Australia to playing a role in reducing global emissions both at home and in countries that would buy Australian produced hydrogen. As part of the National Hydrogen Strategy, we're aiming to build Australia's hydrogen industry into a global export industry by 2030. Australia is uniquely placed to develop a thriving clean hydrogen market over the coming decades, similar to the scale of the LNG industry. Hydrogen technologies have the capacity to meet the needs of Japan and the Republic of Korea, who have made ambitious hydrogen commitments and signalled that they will be important, significant importers Order, of Senator hydrogen Birmingham. from Time 2030. The answer has expired. Senator Macdonald, a final supplementary question. Can the minister inform the Senate how the government is focused on the development of new technologies like hydrogen? Senator Birmingham. Well, our Australian hydrogen strategy indicates that the industry could generate more than 8,000 jobs, many in regional Australia, uh, and generate over $11 billion a year in GDP by 2050. That's why we're working with industry researchers and international partners who are willing to invest and work towards the delivery of the roadmap. We're also supporting innovative projects across the nation, including in Queensland, I'm pleased to say, Senator Macdonald. Just last week, we announced $1.1 million in funding to build a modular demonstration plant. Senator Wish Wilson, um, on a point of order. Order, President. The minister so far hasn't mentioned whether it's hydrogen from renewable energy order. or Senator from Senator Wish Wilson, fuels. it's Thursday afternoon, but that's not even close. Senator Birmingham, to continue. Mr President, as I was saying, uh, I'm pleased for Senator Macdonald and Queensland senators to highlight. Just last week we announced $1.1 million in funding to build a modular demonstration plant at Wollombilla. The plant will produce around 620 kilograms of hydrogen per year, which will be converted into 74 gigajoules of renewable methane. We've also invested $1.25 million in a feasibility study for a renewable hydrogen demonstration project at Stanwell Power Station in Rockhampton. 
This type of innovative work is exactly what we Order. need to see our Senator domestic Birmingham. hydrogen industry grow. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Minister Corman. It was revealed in corrected evidence to the COVID-19 Select Committee that the Prime Minister's hand-picked chair of the National COVID-19 Coordination Commission, former, Mort former Fortescue Medical Metals Chief Executive Nev Power, will receive a taxpayer-funded package of more than $267,000 over six months. Can the minister inform the Senate how much, an in how much income support a mother of three children who had been casually employed for 11 months and is excluded from the government's JobKeeper scheme, forced to rely on JobSeeker, will receive over six months? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, um, a, a single mother in that circumstance will receive the COVID supplement, which effectively doubles the job seeker support throughout this period. So we've effectively doubled uh, government support uh, through that period. Now, in, in, relation, to, in relation to Mr. Uh, Power and, and referencing back to the answer I provided to Senator Waters, uh, he's not receiving a salary. Uh, he does come from uh, Western Australia, and there are some uh, costs, obviously, in terms of travel, accommodation, and other. And, and, and other. And, 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 other. And, uh, and that is not something that has been uh, that is not something that has been uh, negotiated by the government. Uh, it's been it has been it has been it is it is an arrangement that has been put in place by the prime minister's department without the involvement of either the prime minister or his office. And uh, and of course the uh, department has provided appropriate information in relation to these matters. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. A Gold Coast scaffolder who's worked crew to crew company to company for almost 13 years, has been excluded by the government from JobKeeper because he'd only been with his current employer as a casual since September. What does the minister have to say to this worker, his wife and five children, who face living on just $125 a week on JobSeeker after their rent is paid? Senator Cormann. Th th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, uh, again, uh, anyone who is on JobSeeker will be receiving the COVID supplement, which effectively doubles the level of support, and, uh, and in those circumstances, it sounds to me that they are likely to also be eligible for other uh, welfare supports, like potentially rental assistance uh, or uh, family tax benefit payments. And in fact, the uh, person that you referenced in your first uh, answer uh, similarly, similarly would be uh, eligible on, on the face of it to a number of other welfare support payments. Uh, I mean, this is, this is a difficult period, but I mean, I, I can see that there is an attempt here to smear uh, a distinguished Australian who is providing great service to Australia, great service to Australia, and is doing an extremely important job for Australia as we ensure that we are in the best possible position uh, to uh, reco recover strongly on the other side, and who's been working with others, including uh, Mr. Combe, incidentally, uh, who's been working with others to solve a whole series of problems that have helped make uh, people's lives easier, uh, easier all around Australia. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Can the minister explain how the Morrison government justifies paying more than $267,000 of taxpayer money to a former mining executive for six months' work, while casuals employed less than a year, local government workers, university staff and teachers, temporary workers, disability workers and arts and entertainment workers have been deliberately and willfully excluded from the JobKeeper scheme? Senator Cormann. Um, th th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. I mean, this is a, a disappointing um, return to Labour's so let's turn people against each other uh, type attitude. I mean, like, and here she's laughing. Like, I mean, we could, we, could go, we could go through a whole series of jobs and a whole series of people who do great work for Australia and how much they are remunerated, uh, including, you know, we, could, we could go through all sorts of uh, public servants. That, that are doing important job and how they are remunerated. And you know what? Um, the arrangements, the arrangements are entirely appropriate. Uh, Mr. Um, Power and uh, the commissioners on the National COVID Coordination Commission are doing very important work at our national order. Interest. Senator um, Wong, on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. The question is how the minister can justify to sixty-seven thousand dollars, apparently not a salary, but just cost reimbursement, being paid to somebody, given. Uh, the people who the government is excluding um, from job the, the, I've allowed you to restate the question. It was particularly broad in its nature, uh, and an answer can be commensurately broad. 
Senator Coleman. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I'm aware that uh, Ms. Stephanie Foster from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet went forensically in some detail uh, through all of these processes, which is appropriate given it is the Prime Minister's department that has entered into those uh, arrangements. Uh, not, it's not something that was, uh, it was not something that was uh, organised at the uh, uh, ministerial level of government. Order. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Can the Minister inform the Senate how the Liberal and the National Government is supporting regional communities and industries during the coronavirus pandemic through the COVID-19 Relief and Recovery Fund? The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And I thank Senator McKenzie for her question and acknowledge her passion in particular for rural uh, and regional Australia. And Senator McKenzie, uh, as you well know, regional Australians are incredibly resilient. Whether it's the drought, whether it's the bushfires, the floods which actually then followed the bushfires, and obviously now with the impact of COVID-19. Uh, regional Australians, they do come through all of these challenges. Why? Because of their resilience and because of their fighting spirit. Uh, Mr President, the Liberal National Government is proud to support rural and regional Australia. It's in our DNA, as Senator McKenzie well knows. Mr President, we have recently established the $1 billion COVID-19 Relief and Recovery Fund to support regions, communities and industry sectors that have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Through the fund, the Commonwealth is providing timely support when and where it is most critically needed. Over $600 million has already been committed, supporting industries including aviation, agriculture, fisheries, tourism and the arts. Mr President, these measures include support for regional aviation under our $100 million regional airlines funding assistance and the $198 million regional airline network support programs, relief for federally managed fisheries through the waiving of nearly $10 million in levies, air freight support for agriculture, fisheries and forestry industries to help businesses during this time export produce into key overseas markets when return flights bring back vital, vital medical supplies, medicines and equipment, funding for vulnerable areas of the arts sector, including help for regional artists and organisations. Mr President, the Liberal National Government is proud to support regional and rural Australia. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Well, that gives us much uh, to be proud of, Senator um, Cash. Thank you. How will this package, along with the Liberal and National Government's $100 billion 10-year infrastructure pipeline, support job creation and economic activity that will be essential to Australia's economic recovery from the coronavirus crisis? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, the Liberal National Government is, of course, committed to supporting jobs and the economy at this critical time, uh, including jobs of those in the construction and building supply chain. Mr. President, it is a well-known fact that infrastructure is a key enabler of the economy. It supports economic activity, it sustains employment, and of course, it drives long-term productivity. It will be essential to our economic recovery once the health crisis passes. Road and rail projects currently underway are expected, Mr. President, to support up to 85,000 direct and indirect jobs over the lifetime of the projects. We're also working, as you know, with state and territory and local governments to get additional projects underway, and works are commencing in some corridors. Mr. President, since coming to government, more than 300 major projects have been completed. And those, job, uh, and those projects Order. created Senator jobs. Cash. Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. Mr President, is the Minister aware of any projects that demonstrate the job-creating potential of the Liberal and the National Government's infrastructure pipeline? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And, uh, uh, yes, I am. Uh, Mr President, our infrastructure investment is vital to Australia's immediate and long-term economic prosperity. There are around 160 projects currently underway across our great nation that are improving safety, improving productivity and, of course, creating jobs. These include high-profile examples like the Western Sydney International Airport, Senator Payne, and the 1,700-kilometre 
inland rail projects. Um, but, Mr. President, there are of course more. The government has brought forward and invested new funding of more than half a billion dollars of road projects that will drive jobs, strengthen the economy and get people home sooner and safer, including in regional Victoria. $370 million of the new package was planned to be spent in just the next 18 months to get these projects done. And Senator McKenzie, we're working harder to ensure that even with the impacts Order, of COVID-19, this time for the answers expired. Senator Cormann. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I'm sure everyone is uh, very disappointed, but I asked that further questions be placed on a notice paper. Wait and. Are there any motions to take note of answers? I'm calling Senator Gallagher, am I? Thank yes. you. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Cormann to the question I asked. <laughs> well, I actually was waiting for you to move this. You took me by surprise. Um, and I'm, well, I will, I'm always nice, um, but I will raise uh, some points about the labour force figures, which, as I think everyone in this place uh, today uh, when those figures were released, uh, completely devastating and a real sobering um, message to all of us here about the devastating impact that COVID-19 is having on our economy and our society. Whilst these are, figures are released as numbers, every number behind them has a story, every person um, and their family and the pressure that comes with losing a job, losing a job so suddenly and also not being able to find another job. Um, in the times uh, that we are currently living. These are also figures I don't think any of us ever expected we would see—600,000 people losing their jobs in a month, one out of every five Australian workers either losing their job or having less work, uh, the effect on young people, youth unemployment jumping 2.2 percentage points, the largest monthly increase on record. These are um, staggering numbers and I think really highlights for me the importance of getting the economic recovery right and for the government to consider these uh, numbers and the people that sit behind them. And that's why my question today went to giving the government the opportunity to reconsider some of the decisions they've taken. We accept that JobKeeper and JobSeeker were put together uh, in an urgent way to address and, uh, in a sense, align with the restrictions that were urgently being put in place to uh, flatten the curve, the health curve, and that that uh, was done in a matter of days. But we have also consistently, over the past couple of months, raised uh, issues around eligibility, particularly where we think there, that the government could have um, allowed more into the scheme, into the JobKeeper scheme in particular where some of the eligibility criteria has been unfair, where uh, you know, a young person who um, has a part-time job but has had that part-time job for a couple of years um, might have gone from earning $200 a week to all of a sudden earning $750 a week, whereas someone who by uh, merely length of service, you know, 11 months, 10 months, 8 months, but with significant dependence um, and other costs um, is denied access to JobKeeper on those grounds alone. And we think there are some inconsistencies that uh, the government could have used this time to, uh, to get right, and we still think that's the case. I mean, we believe the shorter the unemployment queue uh, is, even at the peak of this economic crisis, the better it will be in the long run to keep people off the unemployment queue. And it would be interesting to know whether the government had advice from Treasury about whether, if they'd gone bigger, if they'd gone earlier, if they'd allowed the eligibility um, for casuals, uh, for uni students, uh, for uni staff, for casual teachers, whether they would have, um, whether that would have meant less people would be reflected in these figures today. Uh, 500,000 uh, people left the labour market in entirely, not looking for work anymore, not in a job, and they aren't reflected in the official headline results. Gone. And we know where they've gone. They've gone on to Job Seeker. They've gone to Job Seeker because they weren't able to keep their employment relationship going. And that's what we have concerns about. 
We know that the recovery out of this will be longer and harder. It will be different across particular industries, disproportionately affected by uh, the restrictions that have been put in place. And this is the issue that we have been urging the government uh, to rethink. And today's numbers, I think, gave them the opportunity to have to look at this and think, yeah, actually, we could look at this and we could look at how many more people we could get out of unemployment and back into some connection with their job. This is something we will continue to press because the big decisions that were taken urgently, the time that we have now to reflect and to understand some of the statistics, will actually determine the recovery out of this. And for young people, I think when you look at the underemployment rate, and the youth unemployment rate, we can see already the disproportionate impact that young people are going to have. They will be out of the labour market. The ones that have just entered will be forced back. The ones that want to get into it probably won't be able to. And they will carry these years, for however long it takes to recover, with them for the rest of their career. So we would urge the government to keep their mind open and consider changes where they are sensible to be made. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. If there's one thing Senator Gallagher and I agree on, it's that the economic recovery from this health crisis is very important. And there's no doubt that the Australian economy and the many Australians um, who make up as a group that economy have taken a big hit as a consequence of the coronavirus pandemic. But it's important to note that we approached this crisis from a position of strength. While those on the other side had been demanding that um, this government abandon financial responsibility and start handing out wads of cash late last year, we held fire knowing that it's important to have some money in the tin for a rainy day, something up your sleeve for when times get tough. And 2020 has provided a number of those tough times. And no doubt there are many Australians feeling acutely that pinch. So that's why the government has taken decisive action to address the consequences of the coronavirus pandemic. The JobKeeper payment, a $1,500 a fortnight payment worth $130 billion to the Australian taxpayer, has been brought in to tackle this significant economic impact. And it works by keeping Australians tied to their workplaces through this difficult time. It's had enormous take-up. That tells us something about the nature of the economic impact of coronavirus, but it also tells us something about the nature of Australian businesses and their desire to do the right thing by their staff, their desire to keep them on, ready to take up the mantle once more once we get through this difficult time. There has been record take-up. But since then, we have seen just so many examples of how this payment is working to help in my home state of Queensland. Sam O'Connor, the member for Bonnie, knows just how well the JobKeeper payment can save a business. Recently, he met with Tula from the Frig Cafe, which has two cafes in Brisbane and in Labrador on the Gold Coast. Tula says there is no way her business would have survived without JobKeeper assistance because business has, during the period of restrictions, been down 80 per cent. Sam visited on the Saturday before Mother's Day to put some hampers together and saw firsthand the benefits of what JobKeeper does because her six staff, vital staff members employed, who make tasty burgers, pancakes and schnitzels for every breakfast and lunchtime, still have a job. In the electorate of Ford, where we have the wonderful example of Packer Leather, an Australian fifth-generation family-run manufacturing business, they are delighted to be able to report to their outstanding local member, Bert Van Manen, that the JobKeeper payment has allowed them to keep their 100 local staff members on the books. They were established in 1891. They have survived the Spanish flu, two world wars, the Great Depression, the rise of plastics and foreign competition offshore manufacturing in a number of recessions, and now, with the help of the Morrison government, they are surviving this crisis as an international leader in the production of high-performance leathers. They are a great example of the Australian fighting spirit and the sort of businesses that JobKeeper, through the help of the Morrison government, 
and the Australian taxpayer is helping people keep working, keep that business going for the recovery. Ross Faster, the member for Bonner, has spent time with the owner of the Manly Deck Bar and Restaurant named Satir. He explained that without the JobKeeper payment, he wouldn't have been able to continue his daily operations. Laura Gerber, the fantastic new member for Corumban, has noticed that the business of Rainbow Meats in Corumban Waters, owned by Peter, has lost an enormous amount of trade, 80 per cent of total revenue. Peter said that the JobKeeper program is the only thing keeping their doors open right now. It just simply wouldn't be possible without that program helping to subsidise staff wages through this hard time. Ray Stevens, the member for Mermaid Beach, met Lincoln Tester, the owner of Madison's Cafe in the Broad Beach Oasis, a cafe I'm very fond of. And Lincoln said very flatly the business would not have survived without the JobKeeper payment. That means he wouldn't have been able to keep his many staff on during this time. I could keep going with example after example of the businesses that are surviving this hard time because of the measures put in place by this government. And I could tell you story after story of workers who are hanging on because of the assistance they're getting through the JobKeeper payment or even in thank a worst you, case Senator scenario. Thank you, Senator Your time has expired. Thanks. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, that's all well and good, but when you consider the, uh, the lines, the Centrelink lines, the queues of, uh, of uh, hundreds, uh, if not thousands, of Australians who were standing uh, around the Centrelink lines and who still continue to do so, uh, we do know that today these a ABS labour force figures are incredibly devastating figures. Uh, to show that 2.7 million Australian workers have either lost their job or had less work in April, <coughs> that's one in every five Australian workers. So more than half a million Australians have lost their jobs between March and April, and yes, pushing the unemployment rate to 6.2%. Uh, that equates to around 19,810 jobs lost each day during that period. These are workers, their families, and they need to put food on the table for their family, their children, and their people who are our friends, our relatives, our neighbours, and people in our community. And underemployment rose to a record rate of 13.7 per cent, with over 1.8 million Australians underemployed. And the number of underemployed Australians was already at a record high well before the pandemic. Labor has been calling on the government to respond to record underemployment even prior to COVID-19. And that is really important to note. And Labor's call to broaden out the JobKeeper package to cover the sectors most affected just has not been listened to. It was Labor who called for these wage subsidies in the first place. And then we called on the Morrison government to broaden the JobKeeper package to include the 1.1 million casuals who had been with their employer for less than one month. If that had been done, if the Morrison government had listened, these figures could be and should be better. The unemployment queues are longer than they need to be because many Australian workers have been excluded from the government's JobKeeper program. When we look at the JobKeeper program, the government is still leaving people behind, particularly the most vulnerable, casual employees, people in whole sectors like the arts and entertainment sector. They aren't even getting the support that they need, and the government does need to respond to this. Again, these people are the people behind the statistics. They are our families. They are our friends. They are our relatives. They are our neighbours. They are our community members. This week was meant to be the budget week, and we thought in the new climate we would at least see a response from uh, Minister Josh Frydenberg of substance. But that did not happen. No substance, just a few old figures put together. In contrast, Labor is looking towards a recovery, and we're looking to how it needs to happen. We are putting forward practical suggestions about job keeper and job seeker. Unemployment and underemployment have been turbocharged by this crisis, but they are not new challenges. The labour market has been weak for some time. What we actually need in this country is a government that has vision beyond day-to-day -day politics. Now is not the time to play politics, and we've been showing bipartisanship 
But that doesn't mean remaining silent. We have a responsibility as a party of working people to stand up for all of the wage earners of Australia. And we have been a responsible opposition, making constructive suggestions about the faults in the design of the job seeker scheme, just as we made constructive suggestions about unemployment benefits, the partner income test, mutual obligation, supporting students, relief from evictions, childcare, telehealth, charities, access to broadband and the aviation sector. It was our First Nations caucus of the Federal Labor Party that pushed for the CDP program to remove the mutual obligation, so First Nations people uh, did not have to be penalised again and again in an environment where this pandemic was going to so critically impact uh, those uh, CDP participants, 33,000 of them uh, in, in Australia, uh, predominantly First Nations people. These were constructive. Uh, uh, suggestions by the Australian Labor Party to encourage the government to move far more quickly and precisely to enable uh, all Australians to have an opportunity to get through this pandemic and to continue to get through in life in general post this pandemic. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Scar. Uh, Madam, Acting, uh, sorry, Madam Deputy President, uh, I must say. Uh, I find it somewhat perplexing that after the federal government has announced a $130 billion JobKeeper payment uh, scheme, that those on the other side of the chamber uh, simply say, well, it didn't go far enough, it should have gone further. It should have gone further. First, and let me make a few points on that. First, you can't look at the JobKeeper payment scheme in isolation. You have to look at it together with the government's overall response, and that includes the job seeker payment attribute of the government's response. And that includes the $550 COVID supplement, which is paid each fortnight to people who are on JobSeeker. So it is simply not the case. It is simply not the case to assert that this government has left anyone behind. This government has sought on every occasion to provide generous assistance to everyone in our society who is impacted by this awful pandemic. And can I say, in my electorate of Queensland, across Queensland, Queenslanders, by and large, have been absolutely applauding the federal government's efforts to keep Queensland businesses operating and to provide general support to all Queenslanders. I take the point that those casual workers who have been working for a specific employer for less than 12 months are not included in the JobKeeper scheme. I take that point. And in response to that, I'd just say this. First, they have access to the job seeker relief payment. Secondly, the basis of the job keeper payment was to keep specific employment relationships between employers and their longer term or permanent employees. And the line has to be drawn somewhere in that respect. And the line was drawn in this case with respect to people who are casuals of a casual employees of an employer for less than 12 months. Why? Because they haven't got that long-term employment relationship that a full-time employee has, a part-time employee has, or a casual employee who's been providing work for the same employer for over 12 months. But they're not left behind. They're given access to the job seeker payment. So it is simply not the case to say that they're left behind. And Senator McCarthy, you say that we need to look towards recovery. We need to look towards recovery. Can I say to you, if those opposite, if the opposition wants to look forward towards recovery, I don't think, I don't think it's the right thing to do to throw bricks at some of those great Australians who become commissioners of the COVID-19 Commission of Coordination. I don't think it's the right thing, Senator McCarthy, for bricks to be thrown at people like Ned Power. He doesn't need to do this job. He's been a chief executive of Fortescue Metals Group. He doesn't need to do this job. And I thought it was absolutely tawdry and disgraceful that in this place, when you, through the, through the deputy president, rightly talk about moving forward, looking towards the recovery—and I absolutely agree with your comments in that regard—but at the same time, 
but at the same time your colleagues are there throwing bricks at a great Australian, in fact a great Queenslander. I'll claim him as a Queenslander. He's now living in Perth, but he was a Queenslander. A great Queenslander about the fact he's getting his travel expenses and a per diem, and a per diem to perform that role. He's doing that because he's a great Australian. He's a great Australian, and he does not deserve to be attacked in this chamber by the Australian Labor Party. He does not deserve to be attacked by the Australian Labor Party. He should be congratulated, as all the members of that commission should be congratulated, for putting their hand up at a time of great need in his, in his country, like all the other commissioners have. They put their name, names forward. They put up their hand. When they were asked, they came forward to help their country at this time of need. They did not deserve that tawdry performance, which we saw in question time. They didn't deserve it, Senator. They really did not deserve it. So the Australian government is providing generous support, generous assistance across the breadth and width of this country. We're providing generous support, generous assistance, and we are looking. We are looking towards the future. We are looking towards the future. Thank you, Senator Scar. Um, Senator Sheldon at the lectern. Good. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy uh, President. Well, first of all, you know, of course, noting this uh, horrific and devastating figures of 600,000 jobs in April uh, being lost, the effect on Australian families and the communities right across this country, um, the effects on restrictions and, from, and business shutdowns. And of course, when we look at one in five people, uh, when you look at the issue of underemployment, a significant plague on this country prior to COVID-19. And of course, you look at those hard-hit people, those hard-hit workers that are not receiving support, you know, casuals with less than 12 months, the arts and entertainment industry, local government workers, and of course, many workers right across the, our, our markets. You know, the JobKeeper wage subsidy, of course, was a very good idea, but it's been incredibly badly implemented. Throughout this discussion on JobKeeper, we've been constructive, supportive and responsible. But too many Australians have been left out and left behind, some accidentally, but clearly many deliberately. From day one, we've seen the scheme should have been better targeted so that people who really need it can get it, and we don't waste taxpayers' money. You know, it's laughable as we're talking about what we should be doing about JobKeeper and dealing with this crisis of these unemployment figures, that we have one minister, Dutton, making a laughable comment, as he said, a laughable comment, he said, from the Queensland government, the fact that they are going to invest $200 million into revitalising Virgin and saving 16,000 jobs. Well, the only thing that's laughable is obviously Minister Dutton. You know, quite clearly, he might be better off concentrating on his day job because he's not able to stop plague boats from leaving this country and causing undue harm right across this economy. To people that have been killed and lost their lives, his failure has cost this country and those individuals that have been directly affected. It's quite clear that we need to be having a policy that turns around and includes those people that have been left out. You know, just earlier today, we had a motion regarding Donata workers, which the government and One Nation decided to abandon 5,500 workers at Donata. We've seen the Prime Minister make the announcement with uh, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg that Australians know we've got their back. But very quickly it became clear that JobKeeper would not have the backs of hundreds of thousands of Australians and their families. Which is why we tried to legislate to make sure that we, through amendments, that we could make sure that those people were given the protections they needed, including those I've already mentioned, migrant workers and international students who pay tax and who come here in good faith. These amendments, of course, were defeated by the government uninterested in helping those Australian tax-paying workers. 
We saw them on numerous occasions. From the 1st of July, the government moved to exclude Australian workers in universities. And as I mentioned, Australian comp workers who count companies are ultimately owned by a foreign sovereign entity. It was outrageous and a cruel stroke of the pen that left thousands and thousands of families out in the cold. The government has shortchanged this country and shortchanged all those hundreds of thousands of workers across this country. Workers in Donata have been striving to make sure that their operations, when the aviation industry comes back, is vital, operating, it's ready to boom the tourism industry to get us snapped back. Well, this government's adamant about having snap off, not defending Australian workers, not appropriately supporting and having the back of every Australian, and applying double standards to hard-working Australians that have been paying their taxes. It's incredibly important, with the struggles ahead, that JobSeeker is properly allocated to support all Australians, all taxpaying Australians that we've mentioned on numerous occasions in this place. I applaud the government to give reconsideration because they can make a difference. Thank you, by Senator the stroke Sheldon. Of the pen. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator Gallagher to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thanks, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer given to my question to the Minister for Finance representing the Prime Minister. Now, I asked about the little fossil fuel cosy group that the government has appointed and is paying with taxpayer funds, the COVID Commission. And I asked initially how they can be confident that conflicts of interests with this fossil fuel buddy group aren't going to dominate the recommendations of this body. There are no guidelines that pertain to how conflicts of interests are to be disclosed or managed. We learnt yesterday that, in fact, special advisers to that commission, who can be co-opted or appended, they don't even have any obligations about disclosing or managing conflicts of interest. And on top of that, we know that the Commission's advice to government will be treated as cabinet in confidence. So we don't know what rules they're operating under. We don't know how they're managing conflicts of interest. Uh, and we don't even know what they're advising the government to do. And so I asked the minister, well, how can you be confident that they're putting the public interest ahead of their own private interests or the interests of the industries from whence they hail? Well, the minister is, uh, is confident that they can manage those conflicts. Well, isn't any wonder that we still don't have a federal anti-corruption watchdog, despite it being nigh on a year and a half since this government reluctantly promised to deliver one, when this government thinks that flagrant potential for conflict of interest can just be somehow managed? It's the Commission's own responsibility. They don't even want to put any guidelines in place. Well, it is no wonder that the public think that this government is completely opposed to transparency and accountability and that we desperately need an anti-corruption watchdog. Now, the reason for this, of course, is that um, the fossil fuel industry has been very busy under the cover of COVID. They've, uh, it's been collated by a group called Fossil Fuel Watch. There's been 14 requests to cut environmental laws or corporate regulations. There's been 11 requests for tax cuts and concessions, and might I say more tax cuts and more tax concessions. There's been 12 requests to fast-track projects, but the minister says these conflicts can be managed. The appointees on the commission they don't have any guidelines. They don't apparently have any criteria on which to base their recommendations to government. Or if they do, we won't be told that either, and we won't be told what their advice to government is. Well, you know. I think it's going to be pretty obvious what their advice to government is going to be. A bunch of people up to their necks in the fossil fuel industry, now getting paid by the taxpayer, will no doubt recommend to the government that the economic recovery out of the COVID crisis is in fact yet more fossil fuels. We're about to start the fire season again and we just saw the worst bushfires in history, but this government has forgotten all about its inept handling of that crisis. And it's forgotten all about the real underlying crisis that will still be on foot when the COVID crisis is dealt with, and that's the climate crisis. And yet it puts in charge of an advisory body a bunch of people that want to make the climate crisis worse. 
to make more money for themselves and their industries and their shareholders. But we don't need conflict of interest guidelines. Everything's going to be fine. Go back to sleep, folks. We've already seen that a gas-led recovery is being proposed by the so-called Minister for Emissions Reduction, biggest misnomer in history, and it's no wonder when you look at the makeup of that COVID commission. Now, we are concerned that whilst this government has been laudably paying attention to the health experts in dealing with the COVID crisis, they are ignoring the climate experts in dealing with the climate crisis. Why is it that scientists are sometimes good and sometimes to be ignored? Well, unfortunately, I put that question to the minister and he chose to answer a different aspect and conveniently ignore that question altogether. But we do not need a so-called gas-led recovery. Gas is a dirty fossil fuel. It wrecks farmland. It destroys underground water. It frequently dispossesses uh, First Nations and traditional owners. That's why I've had a bill in this place for nigh on 10 years to give people the right to say no to it. And then finally, I asked about the obscene amounts of payment that these folk are receiving. Um, but it's meant to be OK because it's not a quarter of a million dollars in salary that this guy's receiving, the chair of the commission, for six months. It's only in expenses. The minister somehow thinks that makes it better, that the chair is receiving a quarter of a million dollars in expenses only to do a job, when this government is proposing dumping people back down to $41 a day below the poverty line in September, and it won't even support a million casual workers on JobKeeper. The priorities of this government are abundantly clear. It's government by the rich for the rich. Thank you, Senator Waters. So the, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Waters to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I declare that.